As I write, highly civilized human beings are flying overhead trying to kill me. They do not feel any enmity against me as an individual, nor I against them. They are only doing their duty, as the saying goes. Most of them, I have no doubt, are kind-hearted, law-abiding men who would never dream of committing murder in private life. On the other hand, if one of them succeeds in blowing me to pieces with a well-placed bomb, he will never sleep any worse for it. He is serving his country, which has the power to absolve him from evil. Welcome to Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone. That's an excellent George Or Orwell quote from an article titled, England, Your England, regarding the Second World War. Today, we will be talking about the book Propaganda by Edward Bernays. We'll be speaking with Pete Quinones of the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast. Check out his excellent documentary, The Monopoly on Violence, as well as my favorite of his many episodes titled, Dismantling Political Authority and the Social Contract with Michael Humer. Uh, Pete, thank you so much for your time, man. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, we're going over this book. Good to talk to you, man. Last time it was no treason, and this couldn't be a better follow-up and a more timely follow-up. So uh, I want to talk about the biggest uh, propaganda that I see today, which uh, you uh, did a good job summarizing in an article titled, um, I'm sorry, I just have it here. The state is all about double standards. What is the premise of that brief article of yours on the Libertarian Institute? It's just about language. It's, you know, if the state has, oh, you're going to make me pull it up. I can't remember now. Um, enhanced interrogation is what the state does. But if we did it, it was torture. When the state, the state taxes, it's called taxation. If we do it, it's called theft. It's just that the brilliant way that the state crafts language to make everything they do seem to be legitimate. Whereas if we try to do it, they have a, another set of language they use that makes it sound like what we're doing is wrong, which it would be, but it's also wrong when they do it. Exactly. And that's why that Orwell quote is so great. It's like, you're committing mass murder, but you don't think you are because you're part of a group with a flag uh, uh, called the government group, really? That, I mean, that is the perfect amount of propaganda. So the book is called Propaganda. It was written in 1928 by Edward Louis Bernays. He was an Austrian-American pioneer in the field of public relations and propaganda, referred to in his New York Times obituary as the father of public relations. Bernays was named one of the 100 most influential Americans in the 20th century by Life magazine. Starting with the definition of propaganda on page 49, he says, um, it itself, the word propaganda, has certain technical meanings, like most things in this world are neither good nor bad, but custom makes them so. I find the word and define it in Frank and Wangel's dictionary in four ways. And the primary way that he uses the definition is Effort directed systemically toward the gaining of public support for an opinion or a course of action. Do you think that that is a fair definition in how propaganda is used today? I think that that is a nuanced, is too nuanced. I think it's so blatantly used today that we could take that language and make it a lot simpler. But it's it, it works perfectly. If it, that would be the definition in an academic setting, and I think it would work perfectly. I want to start uh, with chapter one, titled "Organizing Chaos: The Conscious and Intelligent Manipulation of the Organized Habits and Opinions of the Masses is an Important Element in a Democratic Society." Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed; our minds are molded; our tastes are formed; our ideas suggested largely by men we are, have never heard of. This is justified, Bernays says, because in the absence of propaganda, inefficiency and confusion among the masses will occur. So it's important to have string pullers. It is the purpose of this book, he goes on to say, to explain the structure of the mechanism which controls the public mind and to tell how it is manipulated by the special pleader who seeks to create public acceptance for a particular idea or commodity. Thoughts on chapter one? 
immediately the word democracy jumps out at me because every boomer con who hears that word, you know what their response is, right? It's like, mm -hmm. well, we're not a democracy. We're a republic, dude. Mm -hmm. And that's when I always ask them, I'm like, then why is voting so important? Uh, from mm -hmm. what I understand, the implementation of a republic would decrease the importance on voting, but got to vote, man. This is, this is the most important election of our lifetime coming up this year. But even if it was a one man, one vote, 50.1% ruled, propaganda could still sway that. It's not like people are going to, if you and I were to vote, and I, know, I, th I don't think either one of us <laughs> would. But if you and I were to vote, we'd be going there with a certain purpose. And probably the purpose would be to vote for whoever we thought would win some of our freedoms back, if we were so inclined to do that. The average person is going to vote out of some sense of tribalism or they need to get something they want out of it. And normally that's material, especially with the size of our government, the welfare state and everything. So what, you, what people need to understand is that a lot of times people aren't going to vote out of their best interests because of propaganda, because they're being told, they're, they're being manipulated by advertising, which this book talks a lot about, um, and just straight up influence of power players using the news, using advertising, using education, using the, what I like to, what Moldbug calls the, the cathedral, to not vote in their best interest, but to vote in the interest of themselves. And that's exactly what, if you want to take an overview, a bird's eye view of what this book is, it is teaching you how those people who want to get their way pushed forward, and they have the voice that you don't through the media or whatever, how they're manipulating you and how they're manipulating to use the, the phrase of another great book, Walter Lippmann, Public Opinion, how to manipulate public opinion using propaganda, using influence to move the needle in their direction. And if you understand propaganda properly, people who succumb to it, they're not doing, they're not voting, they're not acting, they're not even sometimes commerce, engaging in commerce in their best interests, but in the best interests of those who are influencing. Definitely. I mean, the fact that uh, we have someone so influential, the father of public relations, uh, that, that we have him on record saying that there is an invisible government that really does throw a wrench into the average idea that um, we couldn't really have people doing things in secret. Everything, you know, it would have leaked. It would have gotten out. And uh, the government is a representation of people's feelings. One, I don't even know if that's a good idea because people are uneducated, as I would be on pretty much anything. Thank God there's not voting on how a laptop should be made and everyone gets a vote. It, that would make things worse. So uh, usually uh, I see the ability of uh, getting people involved is just prime for be getting them manipulated because how many people are going to take time to research, uh, I don't know, U.S. involvement in Niger? It would take a ton of time for you to find out about that one thing, let alone environment, EPA, FDA, uh, you know, the minimum wage. And then once you find all that out, you get a one in 150 million vote that we don't even know if it's counted or not. So this, th the state is the perfect mechanism that's already primed for propaganda. Any final words on invisible government uh, justifying propaganda because of inefficiency or uh, the idea of democracy? Um, I think democracy is one thing that is being pushed right now. I think that if the powers that be could do anything right now, if they could just flip a switch on any one thing that is beyond their power, it would be to get rid of the electoral college.
that they want one man, one vote, and they want true democracy. And I think we both could admit that the president really doesn't have a lot of power, but whoever the president is in there has a lot of influence. And they're going to use that influence to their, to their advantage as best they can. Absolutely. Going on to chapter two, titled The New Propaganda. But instead of a mind, universal literacy has given him rubber stamps. Rubber stamps inked with advertising slogans, with editorials, with published scientific data, with the trivialities of the tabloids and the platitudes of history, but quite innocent of original thought. Each man's rubber stamps are the duplicates of millions of others, so that when those millions are exposed to the same stimuli, all received identical imprints. Propaganda in the broad sense of uh, is in the broad sense an organized effort to spread a particular belief or doctrine. He goes on to show you four headlines from the New York Times saying these are all examples of propaganda, saying they are set down rather to illustrate how conscious direction is given to events and how the men behind these events influence public opinion. Modern propaganda is a consistent, enduring effort to create or shape events to influence the relations of the public to an enterprise, idea, or group. It takes account not merely of the individual, nor even of the mass mind alone, but also and especially of the anatomy of society with its interlocking group formations and loyalties. Only through the active energy of the intelligent few can the public at large become aware of and act upon new ideas. Small groups of persons can do and make the rest of us think what they please about a given subject. Thoughts on chapter two? You actually quoted what I think was when I read this, the most important part. Uh, it takes account not merely of the individual, nor even of the mass mind control, but also and especially of the anatomy of a society with its interlocking group formations and loyalties. So what it's say, what they're saying is, what he's saying is, you can't do this to individuals. It's harder to do, you could do it to individuals, but it's much harder. You need to attack groups. And if you can get groups thinking the same way, then you can play groups off of each other. And it's just perfect. I love, um, it says, right above that, it says, it was only natural after the war ended that intelligent persons should ask themselves whether it was possible to apply a similar technique to the problems of peace. I mean, I, before we started recording, I told you after I read this book, it was like, I can't even look at anything anymore. I can't look at a news headline. I can't read anything. I read this, but I'm so happy that I read this before COVID. I'm so happy that I read this before George Floyd, because I think it's caught, I've been able to see through everything they're doing. And as I told you before, it is insanely scary what's going on right now. I mean, they're not, they're not even hiding it anymore. It's just, oh, man, when you, I think in this chapter, the, probably the thing that I took out of it the most was, and I wrote it in the, in the margin. And there, there are very few notes I took in this book. Most of it is just highlighting, but it says here, groups needed. You have to have groups. If you don't have groups that are willing to war against each other, you know, it's like, just go on, you go on Twitter and you post something. You just post something about like, um, I posted yesterday that him choosing Kamala Harris as his running mate, I don't think they want to win. I don't think the Democrats want to win this election. I think they want to make this election about voter suppression. It's just what I see. Vote, they're actually... Um, a voter suppression curriculum is has actually been prepared and it's going to they're going to start doing it in government schools it's going to be even they don't they don't teach civics anymore this will be the civics part of it and it what you see is like when i posted that then you see comments and people start making comments and they're like and they're typical like left right comments it's like oh well no they're doing this because orange man they're doing this because of this and it's just like 
when you start reading books like this, when you start reading like Lippmann, when you start reading, um, Jacques Ellul has a book called Propaganda as well. You, you start just seeing through all that bullshit. You just start seeing through all of that two party bullshit. And you're like, yeah, you're, you're missing the people over here that are actually like pulling the strings on all this. The people over here that have developed the curriculums for school, the people over here who have developed, developed the curriculums for college. You're missing the people over here who write the advertisements for TV. I mean, a great TV show is Mad Men. I mean, it almost exposes exactly the birth of, of advertising in this country. I mean, like serious advertising for TV and it, it's, it's everything. I mean, chapter two of this is, I think, the most important chapter in the book um, because he's still giving you the grand view. Then he starts getting it. We'll start getting into more, um, you know, like specific subjects and specific groups and how they go at it. But yeah, the, the thing I took the most out of this is the, the fact that um, interlocking group formations and loyalties, that, that little section of that sentence right there, I think is the most important thing. Exactly, because that's how you get people to justify total atrocities, is their loyalty to it. I mean, heavens, when uh, I asked uh, someone, you know, wh what he thought about, uh, there was a very in-depth uh, analysis done of Pentagon documents, and it said roughly 90% of people killed in drone strikes under Obama's administration over the span of one year, about 90% were not the target. So uh, th so that basically means civilians. By the way, even the people who are targets, they have very flimsy evidence for, uh, in the same way that, uh, you know, uh, anyone uh, suspected of using hate speech, well, I'm sure that it's, you know, six degrees from bin Laden is how the Pentagon chooses how to murder people. So uh, when you have something like that, it's like uh, you still get people to defend certain things. Obama still loved, absolutely. Bush has now become loved. John McCain is now loved by everyone seen as great statesmen. Keith Olbermann issued an apology to George Bush for not appreciating him on like, you know, week two of Trump being in office. So it's definitely about loyalties. And the thing you said about groups needed is so important just because it, and it's not something you would necessarily think needs to be necessary. Well, everyone's part of a group. Well, why would you criticize a group instead of the principal? For example, if we have a bunch of whites mistreating a bunch of blacks, the, uh, the rational approach would be, well, it's wrong for someone to initiate violence or aggression or severe mistreatment. But when you're able to play the blacks off the whites or the men against the women or the Chinese against the Americans or the Muslims against the Christians, it's so much more beneficial. It gives you so much more ammunition, uh, ammunition rather, to uh, justify your own atrocities and everything bad you like, you're allowed to pin on the opposition. Final ideas on loyalties and, and interlocking formations. Well, you can see it on social media right now, um, ever since we're doing this the day after Biden announced Kamala Harris was his vice presidential pick. She has this horrible record of, you know, her, her record is, just, I mean, she's a cop. She puts people in jail. She's put the poorest people in jail. She's like she's just a character of like a drug warrior but then you look at like biden and you look at trump and i'm watching this on social media this morning where people are criticizing kamala and immediately the left starts posting up meme uh, not memes but like gifs of donald trump and jeffrey epstein and then the right starts posting up memes of joe biden sniffing kids Okay. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I mean, I just released an episode on the whole Epstein thing with Ryan Dawson. I think it's very serious. And I think that in a, in a just world, the police would be going after these people. You know, if this, if we had, if the police were actually doing their job, they'd be going after pedophiles more than they'd be going after people dealing drugs or, I mean, drugs should be sold in CVS. So, Look at the look at how well the propaganda has worked. That you have people when they're arguing, they're not even arguing about 
policy anymore. You bring up policy, like what Kamala Harris has done, and it immediately goes to Joe Biden as a kid sniffer and the Donald Trump, the accusations and all this stuff and like that. And it's just screw policy. I mean, no, no one's talking about it anymore. What does it matter? Hey, three trillion, print three trillion dollars here. Eh, whatever. Eh, you know, it, it is. And why does that happen? People bite into uh, people bite on propaganda, and they swallow it whole. Well, dude, it's amazing. I uh, found out Ghislaine Maxwell's trial is going to start in July. Right now, we're filming this. It's August of 2020. In <laughs> July of 2021, and I literally let out an involuntary ha. <laughs> I just could not believe it, and I go, "Why is anything else on the news besides?" hey, there's a child trafficker who we really need to get against. I mean, the Miami Herald said that there were 80 victims alone. So it's unbelievable that they can get you to focus on absolute nonsense. That is propaganda. It just changing people's direction on where they should focus their efforts. Um, also, uh, we have multiple people, including Eric Weinstein, uh, Virginia Roberts, Maria Farmer, all people who are inside uh, Epstein's Manhattan residence, where they all said that there were hidden cameras there. Where are those cameras? You should have had time to watch them now since the FBI raided the place. Why aren't there massive arrests? Hey, public servants who we pay for, make, tell us you're doing something good with that money. But of course, it's unbelievable. So, okay, chapter three, the new propagandists, molders of public opinion, he calls them, invisible wire pullers, he refers to them as, an invisible cabinet, and he again calls them an invisible government. These are the invisible rulers who control the destinies of millions. A presidential candidate may be drafted on response to overwhelming popular demand, but it is well known that his name may be decided upon by half a dozen men sitting around a table in a hotel room. The idea of invisible government is relative. There may be a handful of men who control the educational methods of the great majority of our schools. Ending the chapter, he says, governments, whether they are monarchical, constitutional, democratic, or communist, depend upon acquiescence, public opinion for their success of their efforts. And in fact, government is only government by virtue of public acquiescence. Industries, public utilities, educational movements, indeed all groups representing any concept or product, whether they are majority or minority ideas, succeed only because of approving public opinion. Thoughts on chapter three? It reminds me of something that Bob Murphy was talking about on his podcast when the Chaz Chop thing was happening people were asking, how, how can this happen? You know, how can you let these people just take over six square blocks of, uh, of a major city? And Bob Murphy said, believe it or not, public opinion moves politicians. Politicians are moved by it. And, and you can go through you know, 2008, Obama's anti-gay marriage. As soon as, as soon as you see the polls in the United States go above 50% pro-gay marriage, now he's, pro, now he's pro-gay marriage. He changes. And Hillary ran on the same thing. Um, being able to craft public opinion, knowing, and let's understand this as well. When it comes to public opinion, I don't know if Bernays... Bernays is very clinical when, but you also have to look at the culture. And if you understand Andrew Breitbart's great quote about politics being downstream from culture, those people have to be able to, the string pullers have to be able to craft cultural opinion as well. And you see that, and that's another, what I mentioned before, advertising, especially through advertising. Um, they are able to get people to go from, you know, minority support of gay marriage to majority support of gay marriage, even though when it was made legal, they had to do it by fiat. I mean, but, you know, they weren't going to let the people vote on it or anything like that. But yeah, public opinion does move politicians. He is right to this day that if the public, if the government wants to 
control public opinion or thinks that things need to be done and they know that the public won't go won't uh buy even bite into the propaganda apple well then they have to create stuff or they have to let stuff happen or they have to tell you that there is a virus out there that's so dangerous that no one you know has it and that people and that it's a pandemic that less than 1% of the people who get it, much less than 1% of the people die from it so that they can redistribute wealth again, so that they can change people's behavior patterns, so that they can get people to worship big pharma and government science. It's propaganda works. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it can, being able to craft public opinion is the always the way is the way kings did it kings had to do it if kings had to do it and they had monarchical power then people who are voted in quote unquote have to do it you have to just because um there's a reason that people listen to um the, the words of president donald trump and not the words of david miscavige head of church of scientology uh, he's responsible for far less deaths and uh, appears to be more intelligent. I think it, we should listen to Miscavige more than we should Trump. But uh, I mean, the fact that people will say, okay, okay, if I write a word down on paper, give me all your money, people will say, you're a psycho wannabe tyrant. But if FDR writes words down on paper that say, give me all the nation's gold through executive order, it happens. The reason that people, first the police officers and then the citizenry, see one as legitimate and the other not as legitimate is public opinion. FDR did not have magic pens or or, or anything else. There aren't, uh, you know, how did he intern like 100,000, 120,000 Americans, German, Japanese, and Italian Americans in the war? It's not because, you know, he's so big and so strong that he forced all of them in there. People imagine that he had the authority to do such a thing. So even in North Korea, the same still holds. It's still one person claiming rights that no one else has. The day that no one recognizes the extra rights the state has, then the mask just falls. The same, uh, the, the time that people start holding principles consistently, then the vast majority of the propaganda has been dealt with. Uh, final words on uh, the government's and popular opinion on chapter three. Oh, what you were just saying there reminded me of uh, Etienne de la Boite, who said that you don't have to topple it. You just have to stop giving it credence. You have to stop giving it legitimacy. You just withdraw your consent on your own. Withdraw. Stop thinking that they have any authority over you. And then if enough people do that, it just goes away. Exactly. Chapter four the psychology of public relations. He says propaganda is now scientific in the sense that it seeks to base its operations upon definite knowledge drawn from direct observation of the group mind. He says man's judgment is a malign of impressions stamped on his mind by outside influences which unconsciously control his thought by playing upon an old cliche or manipulating a new one. The propagandist can sometimes swing a whole of mass of groups' emotions. Men are rarely aware of the real reasons which motivate their actions. Thoughts on chapter four? And pretty much the same thoughts as I think on chapter two is just the string pullers is, okay, let's, let's take it from a more nuanced approach. The propaganda has to be subtle. It has to be so subtle and done so well that you have to believe that it's your choice. You have to believe that this is my idea. I'm not getting this from anywhere else. And then you're, you, that'll actually make you be willing to fight for it. That'll actually be, if somebody says that you're not, well, you must have heard that somewhere else. You will actually fight for it because you'll be like, no, wait, that was for me. That was 100% for me. That's an original thought. And, you know, it's very rare that even very intelligent people have original thoughts. But yeah, the propaganda has to be so subtle and so nuanced and so perfect 
that the people have to believe that they came up with it on their own. Exactly. You can ask people uh, why they believe one thing or another. And it seems much more like the average person has their opinions assigned to them by the media. If you keep digging enough, you'll see that people don't have a justification for why the state should be held to different standards than any other organization. It's not like they support wars based on a in-depth amount of research that they did and weighing the pros and cons, hearing both sides. They just don't have that. And they don't even realize the fact that, well, when the state controls the schooling system, of course, you're going to have a bias towards it. Of course, if you grew up in the Catholic Church, you're going to have a bias towards the Catholic Church. So people's inability to even recognize that I think is really important. It's amazing in 18 and 1928, Bernays was talking about how this is scientific and uh, how people are very much reliant on their unconscious thought. This has been replicated again and again in uh, today's research, uh, especially by a guy at Arizona State, Robert Cialdini, saying that people do not make uh, the decisions rationally, sometimes just because it's so, I, I mean, the amount of time it would take for me to do an in-depth analysis on you know, this mouse alone, let alone everything else I purchase or everything else I do is too costly. So people have sort of defaults. So if you're able to control people's emotions and their default positions, then you got them. Then you really got them. Any other thoughts on chapter four? It's just a little experiment that I mentioned on an episode that I dropped today. Um, when you encounter somebody who you think that you can ask this question to where they're not going to get offended or anything and just ask it in passing say when are you going to stop wearing the mask and see what their answer is because i've gotten a lot of different answers in the south here we have a, there's a little bit of a more independent streak and a lot of people won't say anything you may have to you know, maybe prod them a little bit. But one answer that I get is when the vaccine comes out. Well, did they come to that on their own? Is that a thought that they came to on their own? Or was that fed to them in the media? Uh, or is, and I, I think Bird from Friends Against Government came up with the with the best answer for this is um, he said he'd respect somebody who said, I'm never going to stop wearing it in public. <laughs> <laughs> more, more than the person who would say, you know, when the government tells me to, when Rachel Maddow tells me to, you know, when Tucker Carlson tells me to, or when uh, Fauci tells me to, the person is just like, nope, this is permanent. More, way more respect for them than the other than any of the other answers. Well, that that answer is <laughs> that's even worse than no uh, that, that, than what I do. I I just ask people, do you plan on taking the vaccine? About ninety percent of them say yes, and I go, okay. So you plan on taking something that doesn't even exist. How are you able to make a judgment on something that doesn't even exist? It hasn't been tried because it doesn't exist yet. And therefore you haven't done any research. You're just going to do whatever the popular widely recognized thing is. Don't pretend this is scientific. You can't have a scientific analysis, understanding of something before it comes into existence. But literally that's what people do with so many things. Are you gonna support the next war? Well, they say that I support the troops. That kind of implies I'm going to support the next war. I'm not going to you know, really dig into it. And then, well, well, what if the troops are wrong? Are you gonna say, hey, you guys have no right to invade another country just as Brazil doesn't have the right to invade America? Well, no, you're already planning on believing in things that haven't even come to fruition. So you can't analyze them. It's one thing to say, well, uh, your opinion regarding uh, the current state of healthcare in America is biased. Uh, 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 yeah, sure, everyone's is. But when you have a developed opinion on something that doesn't even exist yet, like I will take a vaccine, I'll put it inside of my body before there's any uh, testing done or any way to know about it, that is, that's beyond propaganda and that is mind control. Propaganda is like the default emotional appeal you feel towards something. Mind control is just, uh, it's like, it's snapping. Now you think this way, now you're gonna take a vaccine for no, for no morally justified reason. Well, and it's not even like they're defaulting to believe something, you know, like you, you mentioned a war, 
Um, it's not like they're default things. You say, well, I believe that we have to support the troops. No, they're de- they're ready to justify it. If they're ready to justify it, they've already made their mind up. There's no, you're not going to argue with it. There's no change in their mind because they're ready to justify why the next war is good, why the vaccine, taking the vaccine is good. And then even Ann Coulter will just have these amazing line, uh, one-liners like, you know, people ask her, okay, so now that it's been five or so years since the U.S. invaded Iraq, when she was asked this question, do you support the invasion of Iraq? And she goes, I don't feel that it's appropriate to comment on a war when troops are currently overseas putting their lives on the line. So in other words, during the war, it's, uh, it's not morally justified to criticize because if you criticize it, that'll hurt morale. That'll hurt the troops. That'll get the troops killed. That'll make America weak and we'll get taken over. So you have to justify everything the troops do. You can't have any standards for the camouflage wearers. It's, it's so ridiculous. Um, I want to get to uh, chapter five, business and the public. The public has its own standards and demands and habits. You may modify them, but you dare not counter them. Samuel Insull, the electric public utilities businessman says, it matters not how much capital you have, how fair the rates may be, how favorable the conditions of service. If you haven't behind you a sympathetic public opinion, you are bound to fail. All modes of sales appeal require the spending of money to make the appeal attractive. Finally, he says, as public knowledge increases and public tastes improve, business must be ready to meet them halfway. Again, uh, it's public opinion in the political sector. It's public opinion in the private sector, in the business sector. Uh, Pete, any thoughts on chapter five? Yeah, that just sounds like good Austrian economics. (laughs) 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 <laughs> <laughs> really it's what the uh, isn't that what the entrepreneur has to do exactly yeah i mean that's uh, that's one of those things it's like i can't argue with that because you know especially reading uh per Bielen's book uh the seen the unseen and the unrealized and that's like chapter one right there <laughs> it's just uh, that's exactly what it is <laughs> Going on to chapter six, propaganda and political leadership. No serious sociologist any longer believes that the voice of the people expresses any divine or specially wise and lofty idea. Public opinion is composed of inherited prejudices and symbols and cliches and verbal formulas supplied to them by leaders. Political campaigns today are all sideshows, all honors, all bombast glitter, and speeches. The politician, however, has used the emotions aroused by words exclusively. An international policy is sold on the basis of the intangible element of personality. A charming candidate is the alchemist's secret that can transmute a prosaic platform into the gold of votes. He mentions President Calvin Coolidge inviting actors for breakfast being a propaganda move, saying events and activities must be created in order to put ideas into circulation. One dare not put all one's eggs in one basket. The important thing for the statesmen of our age is not so much to know how to please the public, but how to sway the public. He talks about the importance of establishing contact with the group leaders who control the opinions of the public. Finally saying, the political leader must be a creator of circumstances, not only a creature of mechanical process of stereotyping and rubber stamping. Thoughts on chapter six titled, Propaganda and Political Leadership. All the world's a stage. What do you say? Almost what you were, the first half of what you we're talking about before you jumped into talking about political leaders reminded me of how it's very it was very important for the political class and especially the cathedral in this country to get rid of religion because they had to replace the religion of you know the invisible man in the sky with the religion of the state and once you get people worshiping the state, then it's game over, game over. Now you can just, it, now you just put them into one of those two parties. They're, they're fighting against each other. Then you get the lesser of two evil votings going for, gener- you know, for a couple generations and you have complete state power. Now, the idea of the, 
the political actor, the, you know, I immediately think of Obama, you know, somebody who was style over substance, just turned out to be another George Bush. Uh, Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton was another one like that, but so was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was very much of that ilk of, yeah, it was, you know, remember Reagan won California, but he was a former governor, not so hard. And he won New York too. So, and this, this isn't a long time ago. (laughs) And uh, so there was a lot of power in just his, the way he came across, the way he talked. And then you want to throw a, a monkey wrench in there. You have Trump. And you had Trump went out there and acted like an absolute buffoon, acted like a lunatic. But so many people were like, yeah, but when I get together with my friends, this is the kind of sense of humor I have and everything. And I've always felt and uh, I didn't vote for Trump. I didn't support Trump. I still don't support Trump to this day. I will defend him if he does something good and I will trash him vehemently if he does something bad. But there was a time in my life where I was like, I wish a regular guy who would just say the things I'm thinking would run for office. I would love to see that. And it finally happened. But by the time it happened, I was, you know, an anarchist or whatever. And and it was apolitical. And I was just in it for the laughs and the memes. And, (laughs) but yeah, it's, (laughs) if you put somebody up there who is, engaging, charismatic, good looking. I'm not saying Trump's good looking. Um, and novel, you know, as Barack, it would say Barack Obama was very novel. Then it play, people tend to forget what they're saying and they tend to vote for what they're being presented as far as not substance, but style. And that, that, come, that comes across pretty, uh, pretty clearly, I think. Yeah, and when he says public opinion is composed of inherited prejudices, that is so big because, you know, I see it, it's so funny. <laughs> well, you know, uh, there are people who were racist. They, uh, you know, believed in different, differentiating people based on an accident of birth. By the way, it's totally okay to kill people overseas because they were born in a different country. I'm sorry, that is in principle no different than racism. Ha, or, uh, so I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, the Vatican with a bunch of friends and one of my very good friend of mine, but she caught me on a bad time. She goes, ha ha, I can't believe people used to think, uh, you know, uh, the Pope has some right to rule. So if I put on a funny hat and just start telling people what to do, people will follow me. Ha ha ha. And I go, no, you'll just have to put on a suit and call yourself president and then they'll do it. That is an inherited prejudice that she didn't even see. And they're like, well, why do you always do this, man? We're in Rome of all places. <laughs> can, can you pump the can, brakes? Can can't you, you just the shut up? At the Vatican? And... <laughs> <laughs> can't you just shut up and enjoy yourself? <laughs> <laughs> it was 90% enjoyment. I just mentioned that one thing. Um, uh, and then he says, political campaigns today are all sideshows. This is, I mean, that's so important because you don't realize it. I didn't, I wasn't going, thank God I'm watching nothing of substance while I was an Obama supporter or a Romney supporter. You don't realize how pathetic it is until you come across the principled teachings of Hans Hoppe, Larkin Rose, Michael Humer, Murray Rothbard. Then you see, it's like, wow, I could listen to a hundred Obama speeches and learn nothing. You cannot read a single page in the problem of political authority without learning something or democracy to God that failed by Hans Hoppe or anatomy of the state by Murray Rothbard. It's just so brilliant on every page. Tom Woods' Meltdown is a great uh, economics book where it's like every single page you're just getting your mind blown about something else. And once you see that, that's why it has to be occulted knowledge. And they have to show you all the CNN, Fox News nonsense to keep you busy because then you realize this is a nothing. When was the last time we heard a principle consistently articulated? Uh, when was the last time you really saw a political speech where you're like, hold on, pause that. I got to take notes and do some research on this later. It's all about- Ron Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, it's been a while. It's all about arousing emotions and getting your prejudice going because if you give, any, if you give them something concrete, 
well, then in four years, it's going to be hard to say, this is the most important election of your lifetime. Now everything's on the line. Get out there and get really invested. Because if you have a principled populist, they'll say, yeah, this is big, but there was also, you know, world wars. There was also Vietnam. There was a civil war. There was a Great Depression. This is not the most important election of my lifetime. So when, uh, so when you're able to think on principle, then you just see through everything and just how fake it is. Final thoughts on chapter six, titled uh, Propaganda and Political Leadership. Yeah, when you think, when you look to the future, I think I'm probably using an idea that I heard from Dave Smith that, you know, 50 years from now, nobody's going to be reading Mitt Romney's books, <laughs> but they'll be reading Von Mises and Rothbard and Hoppe, and they'll still be getting, you'll go on eBay 50 years from now, and you're still probably going to be playing, paying close to list price or even more expensive for their books, but Romney's book you'll be able to get for 99 cents. You know, they, the political politicians have nothing to say and maybe people are buying Obama's book. I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know how much I believe that. Uh, but you know, also Obama was an, an anomaly, but yeah, I mean, the people who actually have something to say, the people who are actually principled, um, they're not going to be, who knows if they'll ever be famous in household names and they'll just be people like me and you will be the ones who, collect their books and try to find first editions and treat them as valuable. Absolutely. Going on to chapter seven, women's activities and propaganda. He goes on to list 14 women's organizations. Uh, going on to say, afford a particularly striking example of the intelligent use of the new propaganda to secure attention and acceptance of minority ideas. So this is not in the book, but this is in an interview where he talks about George Hill, the head of the American Tobacco Company, coming to Edward Bernays and telling him, we have a problem. 50% of humanity isn't smoking. Uh, it's the women demographic. So um, please cure us of the taboo of women smoking. So Bernays spends $125, this is in his own words, to see a psychologist and uh, then he got a hold of the heads of three newspapers, including the New York Times Magazine. And the plan was during the Easter parade to have women smoking torches of freedom to uh, liberate them from the male domination in their life. They're, don't let them tell you what to do. Light up and have a cigarette. Um, to protest man's inhumanity to women. So in three days and $125, he got on the heads of the biggest newspapers, which is the in the 20s and 30s, is the equivalent of being all over Fox, CNN, ABC, and NBC today uh, to uh, get this going. And that is how women were generally introduced to the idea of smoking cigarettes, which he, you know, like proudly takes, uh, but proudly takes uh, acceptance for. And he he tells the story like you would talk about the last Thanksgiving you had. It's just it's just the ideas. It's just creating wide acceptance for the ideas through the propaganda methods. Thoughts on women's activities and propaganda, and uh, securing attention and acceptance of minority ideas. Yeah, if you hadn't brought up freedom torches, I would have because that was the first thing that I thought of. It was uh, a big part of the documentary, the great documentary, The Minds of Men. Or at least one of the one of the main things I took from it, yeah. You know, propaganda is important. I mean, look at um, the temperance movement. The temperance movement was started by women. You know, maybe maybe they saw that propaganda of freedom torches and they were like, huh, huh, this is something we can this is something we can uh, use to our advantage. You know, these lips won't if your lips uh lips that touch alcohol won't touch ours kind of thing yeah. and that was some, that was some great propaganda back in the day but yeah it's uh just more more marketing and more appealing to emotion there's really you're not there there's nothing where you're appealing to somebody's intellect you're just appealing to someone's emotions if you throw the word freedom and something. I mean, it's just like, hey, if you don't, if you don't support the wars, you don't support the troops. If you don't wear the mask, you don't care about me. I'm wearing this for you, not for me. You know, it's so <laughs> selfless. 
So. <laughs> yeah, I uh, definitely see this. And uh, people will often say, you know, uh, and I'll even see it, uh, people who uh, are sort of on our side of the fence here, well, they'll say, you know, what they don't want you to do is A, B, and C. Well, screw what other people want or don't want of me. It's something inherently justified. So the fact that, you know, men don't want you women smoking and engaging in freedom, that's not a justification for me engaging in a certain behavior. So the idea that, well, the terrorists want you, Chris Wallace, so, so we should be uh, uh, taking our uh, advice from Al Qaeda, Mr. Paul, that is so dumb that he says, well, you know, he's saying, Invading countries, killing civilians creates Al Qaeda. And he goes, so we should take advice, uh, we should be taking our orders from Al Qaeda. The idea that you would decide what you want to do based on how someone else in a world of 7 billion people will see it, perceive it, might counteract it. The fact that that's your go-to is really pathetic. Oh, the Democrats want you thinking that. Oh, the Republicans want you. You're just working on behalf of the Jews. You're just doing that on behalf of the whites. You're doing it on behalf of the elites and or the Marxists or the fascists. That's, that's such propaganda that you see all the time that is, uh, that, that's an especially, you know, minority, um, uh, it, it's a minority targeted method of propaganda. Well, another one is just all the fall different fallacies you can use. Like the one you were using with, uh, with, with Ron Paul is just the false dilemma fallacy. It's like, okay, I'm saying that we shouldn't do this. And then the other person goes, oh, so you want this to happen? Like there's only two choices. You know, usually there's like five or six or there's endless choices, but it's like, oh, so you don't support. Oh, so you're against the wars. You don't support the troops. It's like, no, I mean, there are, there are other choices there, but that's normally what a really stupid person will jump to or a very manipulative person will jump to. Uh, and those two don't intertwine very often. Or, you know, Tulsi Gabbard opposes uh, U.S. further intervention and regime change for the Assad regime in Syria. And Hillary Clinton just openly says she's a Russian, a Russian asset. Or Joy Behar says, well, Tulsi, you know, Richard Spencer said he'd vote for you. As if that's an argument for anything. It doesn't mean you're working for Putin because you're against mass murder based on lies. It's, so, it's just absolutely incredible. I want to get on to chapter nine, propaganda in social service. The great enemy of any attempt to change men's habits is inertia. Civilization is limited by inertia. So what he's saying is it's not the result of people making independent decisions that further society. It's really people get into a certain way and continue in one way or another with very small amounts of movements. He says a very good example of uh, positive propaganda would be the NAACP, Nash, I think it's National Association of American Colored Persons. Na National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Advancement of Colored People, thank you. Uh, the decline it's of lynching. Amazing that they haven't changed that yet. <laughs> they, they just have to flip PC, so it's yeah. National People of Color. Um, he says, the decline of lynching is very probably a result of this and other efforts of the association. So again, he's saying that even, you know, good things is it's all about changing public opinion. Like what if you and I snuck into wherever, I don't know where the laws are kept, Library of Congress, you and I sneak in there and it turns out on one of the sheets of paper, it says lynching is legal. Well, that's not going to change the number of lynchings in the United States. The cops are probably not going to enforce it. No politician is going to say, well, that's the law because of the current uh, public opinion, where uh, according to Tuskegee University, uh, the number of lynchings in the United States was 4,743. 3,446 blacks were lynched, 1,297 whites were lynched. So the fact that this went from something that was being uh, practiced and accepted to now it's like, uh, you know, uh, Bubba Watson finds a rope that might be something. The fact that that's a scandal. The fact that we went from like lynching exists to this rope looks odd. That, that is, that's such a drastic improvement. So that, that, that is one case for how the general change in public opinion can occur. And it can obviously be for the better. I mean, isn't that what we're trying to do here? Exactly. It, it, it's exactly what we're trying to do. Yes. Yeah. We're just trying to change people's minds to get them to um, 
come over to our way of thinking. I have no problem with that because you know, I think that the propaganda that I'm putting out there, it will be for good, will be for their benefit. Um, I'm, and also for my benefit, I can't, you know, th that can't be hidden, but you know, if you sit down and you look and you say, okay, what are we doing? We're trying to get, we're trying to increase peace. We're trying to reduce violence and we're trying to give people a happier, help people to see how they can be happier. Um, and a lot of people would say that that's not our job. A lot of people would say, no, you should just leave people be, leave people be and uh, leave people to themselves and work on your own. And maybe, maybe, but this is really all I, all I know how to do at this point. Um, there is stuff that I'm doing work on myself. And I think that that's one thing that I hadn't seen for, for a bunch of years was that I really needed to work on myself. And that's important to me. And as I've worked more on myself, I've worried less about what other people think and what other people believe. Because I also just don't believe that we're going to change everybody's mind. Sure. And I also definitely see a difference between changing the way everyone believes versus increasing the amount of insecurity they have regarding their position. So when I argue with uh, someone who's, you know, l let's say a neocon or someone very interventionist, foreign policy or domestic policy, I don't really say, all right, how am I going to change their mind and how am I going to weigh my progress with this person? First of all, I do it almost like sort of a psychology thing. I'm just more interested in people's justifications at any time for why they believe anything. Even if I know for a fact I'm not going to change anything, I, I, I sort of have learned to love the fight. Um, but it's also about just letting them know, hey, Mr. Progressive, you're you're not special because you want everyone to have health care. I want everyone to have health care uh, because that's why I advocate a free market, which through the methods of, you know, Cornelius Vanderbilt, Andrew Carnegie, Steve Jobs, we have all these other people, uh, Amazon, Walmart, that increase the ability for people to access products and services at lower income levels over time. That's why I believe in having a free market in health care. That doesn't change their mind. But that in, it, lets, it takes them down off their high horse. It's like, listen, mister, I support um, you know, the, the government who's there to keep us safe. Uh, we have uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski talking with the same group of people, the Mujahideen, the uh, Wahhabi Islamic fighters in Afghanistan that the U.S. is fighting now. The U.S. was pals with Saddam before they were fighting him. The U.S. is the only, you know, government that's nuked civilians. So don't pretend I'm against 9-11 because it killed 3,000 innocent people, but you support killing 100,000. That makes you 33 times worse. It's not that that changes them. It's that it takes them down off their high horse and makes them a little more humbled and less aggressively promoting their ideas. So it's not always about changing. It is about sort of swaying and moving in one direction or another. Finally, I'm sorry. No, 100%. Finally, chapter 10, art and science. It's amazing. When I read this, I go, art? Well, art, that's not really something you could use for propaganda, being the ch naive child that I am. And then, <laughs> and, and then I go, okay, art can be used for propaganda, movies and music, but you can't use science. Science is objective. God, that was a face bomb. <laughs> <laughs> what a face bomb that was. I read this book probably 10 years ago. Art and Science, Chapter 10. When art galleries seek to launch the canvases of an artist, they should create public acceptance for his works. Propaganda is done by repeatedly interpreting new scientific evidence and innovations to the public that has made the public more receptive. So it's not that there is a vaccine that's been tested and they've had scientists on CNN to debate uh, the tests with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., one of my new heroes, by the way. Um, uh, it's just because they have repeatedly interpreting new scientific ideas and innovations to the public. They've said there will be a vaccine. That's why people support something that doesn't even exist or hasn't even come out. Um, one thing that I want to mention is an article titled, Modern Art Was a CIA Weapon from the Independent. Uh, this was actually a CIA operation where they attempt did to uh, get artists on the payroll, such as Jackson Pollock, Robert Motherwell, William D. Kooning, and Mark Rothko. 
uh, to engage in some sort of abstract art that would be proof of American creativity. Now, that certainly is the front story. There is heavy involvement with intelligence agencies getting in art, music, movies. You also have something called the CIA Entertainment Liaison, which you can find on CIA.gov. It says, our goal is an accurate portrayal of the men and women of the CIA and the skill, innovation, daring, and commitment to public service that defines them. Meanwhile, they declassify their documents if they work for the public, and I'm their boss. I'd be able to say, give me the documents now, but of course, uh, they're not, so that's a lie. Thoughts on art and science used for propaganda purposes. Well, just the, the one you were talking about last, uh, CJ from Dangerous History Podcast has talked a lot about that, how um, every studio in Hollywood has, a CIA, there's an office that the CIA is in, and they're there to make sure that the government is seen at, in a proper light. Okay, so think about this. What about those movies that make the CIA to look like insanely evil villains why would they let those go through because they want you to know we can be insanely evil villains so don't cross us well that's why chuck schumer says trump wants to go against the intelligence agencies they've got six ways to sunday to get back at you it's like <laughs> Oh, thanks for putting that idea out there. He, they just like to make the threat known. But yeah, usually I see the CIA as someone who should be respected and who has all these gadgets to keep us safe. And that's why they have to lie to us. That's why Mike Pompeo can get on a stage in front of cadets and say, uh, what's the uh, CIA motto? Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal. Well, I was CIA director. We lied, we cheated, and we stole. I don't know if you saw that, but Mike Pompeo actually says that on stage and everyone laughs because they believe the propaganda. If I went up to you know a woman on a date and just said, what would I do is I lie, cheat, and steal? Uh, I mean, well, let's not get into the psychology of what that might do, but any sane person would say, oh my God, goodbye forever, you liar, cheater, and thief. But when the CIA does it, it's like, oh, those are our boys keeping us safe and spying on the enemy to protect the homeland. That's all propaganda. Not because they know about MK Ultra or the CIA's a study in assassination or Operation Mockingbird or all this other stuff that, uh, uh, you know, CIA going into Guatemala, overthrowing the Iranian democratically elected Mossadegh. It's unbelievable. Uh, final thoughts on the CIA art and using uh, science, oh God, climate change, global warming, as a justification for propaganda. Well, yeah, I mean, just to, I already touched on art a little bit, but science, I mean, if the last five months haven't taught people mm -hmm. that the government can use quote unquote science for propaganda and especially for behavior control experiments, I, you really need to read this book. <laughs> And, you know, it, it's really amazing that people will say, I believe in the science. Well, science is, ob uh, is objective. So, yes, you would want to believe that. In the same way, history is objective. Regardless of what anyone thinks, whatever happened uh, to O.J. Simpson's wife is what happened. But that doesn't mean I will believe any historian. That doesn't mean I will believe any scientist. I have Dr. Fauci, one of the most powerful medical voices on the planet, on 60 Minutes saying, it makes people feel good to wear a mask, but a mask doesn't do anything. And now he wears a mask when he's 60 feet and six inches away from home plate, throwing a pitch towards a 90 degree angle, of course. But yeah, of course. Um, so, so now it, so it's, it's not that I'm against science. It's that I do not trust scientists like Fauci, especially, who has a totally inconsistent view on something like the mask alone. And this 60 Minutes interview was done in May. It's not like I dug up something from his middle school years where he's talking on the playground. He was openly saying, don't use a mask, um, et cetera, because, but now it's used as a method of control. They go, oh, this is a good justification to see if people will comply. So, yep, the, the new scientific idea is masks. So yeah, just like science is objective, I agree. But so is history. That doesn't mean I agree with whatever the scientific or historical consensus is. Finally, chapter 10, the mechanics of propaganda. Propaganda is simply the establishing of reciprocal understanding between an individual and group. He refers to the Times, the newspaper, as the fact of its accomplishments make it news. In other words, he's not saying, he's saying that 
it's not because this story is inherently built into the fabric of importance. It goes, the Times has accomplishments. They're reporting on it. Therefore, it's news. It's propaganda. It's put into the mind of the populace. The American motion picture is the greatest unconscious carrier of propaganda in the world today. It is a great distributor for ideas and public opinions. Intelligent men must realize that propaganda is the modern instrument by which they can fight for productive ends and help to bring order out of chaos. Final quote in the book. Pete Quinones, final thoughts on the book overall and chapter 10, The Mechanics of Propaganda. I mean, it's it's a book that changed my life. I didn't read it 10 years ago. I actually read it like six months ago, so it's still fresh. And uh, like I said, I'm glad that I had a chance to read it before all the COVID stuff and uh, the George Floyd stuff came down. Um, the Mechanics of Propaganda. I think it's something that we just, as, as many of us as possible, have to learn because it, it's out there. It's in everything. It's every report, everything. I mean, you're talking about Fauci and uh, you know, being 60 feet, six inches away from somebody and wearing his mask. And then he goes in and then he goes and sits in the seats where no one else is allowed to sit. He's there with, I think, his wife and his brother, and they're all pulling down their masks and everything. And everybody's like, well, you know, he's married to his wife and it's his brother and everything. And I'm like, that's not how pandemics work, okay? If this was really a pandemic, you'd be, a husband would be worried about giving it to his wife, vice versa. I'm sure he does. And even if you want to make the argument that he lives with his wife, I'm sure he doesn't live with his brother. So you know, what is it because they're related that they wouldn't be able to spread it to one another? This is all things that people really should be asking and, uh, reading this book will help you to ask those questions and uh, maybe make your life a little more miserable for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just allows you to uh, th think clearly. So what you would do is, all right, there's a pandemic that's killed 100,000 people or 150,000 in America. Is there anything comparable? And then you come across a Jeffrey Tucker's article, Woodstock took place during a pandemic. It's like, what was the pandemic in 1968? And at first you go, well, they're just playing with the word pandemic. Turns out the Hong Kong flu killed a large percentage of Americans. So the uh, population was about 200 million at the time and it killed about 110,000 Americans. So it's like, wow, how did I not know about that? Because it wasn't just, it just wasn't on the agenda of what to propagate people for. How many politicians have we said, you know, this is a lot like, um, you know, the Hong Kong flu, which came and went as viruses do. That's why the death rate isn't getting constantly worse and there's more hospitalizations, even though it's been around longer and people are going out more, the virus comes and the, the, the virus goes is generally an idea of what appears to be happening. So they just use mind control. They just say, it's like the Spanish flu. And Saddam is like Hitler and Assad is like bin Laden. They just get you with this mind control association game instead of thinking about anything on principle. Another big method I see is how you can go from having no income tax to it being obvious that we need an income tax for society to exist. We can go from the NS, you think the government is just spying on everyone all oh, looking through all your stuff. Turns out, you know, the NSA, Thomas Drake, Edward Snowden, these leaks, uh, William Benny, turns out, yeah, that they're spying on everyone. So what do, uh, do we get uh, apologies for being called conspiracy theorists? No, they say, well, that, that's for our safety. Uh, the, the government doesn't uh, kill innocent civilians. All right, well, they don't target innocent civilians. Hiroshima. All right, well, that was a military tactic. They constantly move the goalpost. That is propaganda. Um, and then certainly uh, the Department of Education, what, were people not educated before 1979? Of course they were. But today, if you want to get rid of the Department of Education, I didn't know that you hated uh, people being educated. Another thing is fake reasoning. So they'll do something in secret, like Operation Paperclip, hiring a bunch of Nazi scientists to come to America. And then like 30 years later, they'll be like, well, yeah, but that was done to keep them from going to the Soviet Union and working against us. Well, if that was the story at the time, they would have said, we Americans got the scientists. We are improving. This is going to be innovative. We're going to do all this terrific stuff um, with, uh, with these new scientists we brought on board because we're innovators. No, it's a lie they later make up. Again, you know, 
uh, but Saddam is going to nuke us with his WMDs. We got to go to war. Well, we're staying there to promote democracy. Taliban's going to kill us through Al Qaeda. Well, we're just making sure the Taliban can run Afghanistan. Hitler, uh, but we were attacked by the Japanese, so we had to defend ourselves. Well, we did it to stop the Nazi takeover of the world. It's fake reasoning, which you could call lies, which th they actually are. But on an institutionalized scale, you absolutely get fake reasoning. That is, those are the biggest propaganda methods I uh, take away from uh, fr from this. Uh, any final thoughts on propaganda, Edward Bernays, or modern day uh, ways that uh, the listeners can sort of counteract any propaganda they come across? Yeah, this is such a short book, and it's so well written. Um, it's written for an everyman. It was written in 1928. So a lot of what he's describing is propaganda that was used during World War One. i I'm sure some of the people in Germany were reading this book, along with Lippmann's book, which came, with Walter Lippmann's book, which came out in 1922, uh, Public Opinion. It is, if you want to understand how the press works. I, from what I understand, like Walter Lippmann's book, Public Opinion, is assigned in every journalism class. Mm. It's like, yeah. So these books on propaganda, if you want to understand how the political class, how the power class, how the cathedral is communicating and, be, and to be able to see through it, this is your starting point. I mean, it's, when it comes down to it, it's like maybe what, 80 or 90 pages? And it will, uh, it will open your eyes and open your mind. And you'll be upset for a little while, but you'll get over it. Exactly. I definitely recommend reading the book. You have things like, he actually lists the emotional things that a statesman needs to do in order to arouse emotion in the masses. I do like how he goes through those four titles of the New York Times, because your eyes would normally read that, and then they just keep going. But once you see through it, it's like, wow, this is someone so important, really giving me some insight into something important. So, um, well, I want to thank everyone for uh, watching this uh, very uplifting episode of Keith Knight, Don't Tread on Anyone. Please check out the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast with Pete Quinones. Pete, brother, thank you for your time, man. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks Keith.